Good morning, church family. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you bright and early today. Glad you're with us. Um, if we've not met before, I'm Pastor Bubba. It's my joy to open the Word of God with you today. And we're doing this uh, seven-week mini-series called Generous. This is week number two. If you didn't uh, catch the first week, I do want to encourage you to check that out online because it was kind of a, a foundation week where we really set the, set the table, if you will, for the whole entire series. Uh, and the goal of this series is for us to grow in generosity, particularly as it relates to time, talent, treasure, testimony, so that we can be a blessing to other people. Right? God is generous. We want to be generous so that we can bless others. That's the whole point of it. Uh, and what we learned last week is uh, that God has created us, made us in his image and likeness, and we are given this responsibility to be stewards. And a steward is someone who takes care of something on behalf of someone else. And God has given us the entire earth and everything on it to take care of. And uh, if we are to be faithful stewards, we need help. Amen? <laughs> we need help. And uh, what is it that we need? We need God to give us wisdom. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, this idea that we need wisdom if we're going to be faithful stewards. And so I'd like to uh, pray for us. And then we'll jump into it. We're in Proverbs chapter 8. That's where we'll be focusing today. And so if you would pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy and love. Uh, you are so good to us. You always take care of us. You provide for us. You, pr you protect us. Uh, we just thank you for the greatest gift of all, your son Jesus. And Jesus, we love you. We give you praise and honor and glory. You are the son of God, the Messiah, the anointed one. You alone lived without sin you died for our sin. You rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. In you alone, there is salvation. And we do, uh, God, we just come to you today uh, with open minds and open hearts. We ask, teach us, instruct us. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom. Help us to grow in wisdom. Help us to be a people who live by wisdom. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, uh, have you ever seen uh, little kids, like two little kids, uh, fighting over a toy or something like that? Have you ever seen this, right? Where it's like, it's mine, no, it's mine, and then they're like bickering and going back and forth. It's beautiful, uh, <laughs> right? If you're, if you're a parent, especially uh, of young kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You're like, yeah, I see that every day, it's great. Uh, <laughs> And if you grew up with siblings, then you probably experienced that at some point in your life. Uh, we all have some kind of, you know, awareness of that type of situation. Well, when our boys were little, my wife Shelly did something that I thought was just really pretty brilliant. When they would get into arguments and fights, she used it as a training or teaching moment. Right? And so there would be certain times when they would kind of get into it. And they didn't, honestly, they didn't fight very much as, as little kids. But sometimes they would. And uh, sometimes they would, they would get into an argument and one of them would just rage out. You know, when they just like, rah, freak, completely freak out. And she did this thing with them that I thought was so cool. She, she basically taught them a wisdom versus folly paradigm by teaching them a verse. Uh, it was, I think, Proverbs 29, 11, uh, which basically says a fool has, you know, he, a fool basically loses his temper and a wise man, he stays self-controlled. Uh, he doesn't lose his temper. So in those moments when they would get into an argument and one of them would start to, you know, rage out, she would step in and just say, okay, hey, let's talk about what's going on here. Um, and she would just say, you know, what, is, what, is, what does a fool do in one of these moments? And because they had heard her, you know, time and time again speak this verse, uh, oh, a fool loses his temper. That's right, a fool loses his temper. What does a wise man do? A wise man is self-control. And then she'd say, okay, so do you want to be a fool? And the old little boys, no, I don't want to be a fool. I'm going to be a wise man. Right? That's what they would do. And, and basically, she was calling them up, right? She was calling them up to, to wisdom, what God would have for them. And I just thought that was wonderful because they really grabbed hold of it and took it to heart. And they learned this wisdom versus folly paradigm that was very helpful to them in those moments of relational conflict and even is helpful to this day. Right? Here's the point. 
all throughout Scripture, we see a wisdom versus folly kind of paradigm, and our God is a God of wisdom, a God who wants us to have wisdom, and there is very much a difference between folly and wisdom, right? The fool lives one way, the wise man or wise woman lives a completely different way, and knowing the difference between wisdom and folly makes a big difference in your life. Do you need wisdom if you're going to be a faithful steward? Yes. Right? Can you be a faithful steward without wisdom? No. Right? You can't be a fool and be faithful at the same time. Right? Those things, you know, faithfulness and foolishness, th those things, are, are, they don't go together. They're at odds with each other, right? And so we need wisdom. How do we get wisdom? Well, quite simply, the way we get wisdom is by studying the Word of God. That's the, the, the way we get wisdom. Uh, we can also get wisdom from learning from other people. That's a, another way. Um, but if we want the greatest wisdom, we've got to go to the Word of God. And so today, as we jump into Proverbs, you know, Proverbs is a book referred to as the Book of Wisdom. We're going to look at a section of Scripture where we're going to learn some things about wisdom. There's actually going to be uh, six lessons we learn about wisdom. So we're going to just jump into this, uh, starting, um, the first thing we see is that wisdom is available, right? Wisdom is available. This starts with verses 1 through 4. Also, verse 17 helps us to understand this. Uh, it says this, um, Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries aloud, To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. Verse 17, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Now, it, you, what you'll notice in this, these verses in, here in, 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 in Proverbs 8, you'll notice that um, this idea of wisdom is personified, and it's spoken of as like she or her. And, uh, you know, the Bible is not saying like wisdom is an actual person, this woman, but rather the Bible is using creative language, this personification of wisdom, creative language to help us understand kind of the, the, the dynamics of wisdom. And what do we see here? We see that, you know, wisdom makes herself known. She's not hiding, but rather uh, she's out in the streets, right? She's in the crossroads, right? She's like in full view of whoever's looking. Uh, she's not quiet, but rather wisdom is uh, speaking, not only speaking, she's crying out, hey, I'm here, I'm here. What does this show us? It shows us that wisdom is available. Anyone, anyone who wants to seek wisdom, and anyone who does seek wisdom diligently will find wisdom, right? So wisdom is available. That's the first thing we see. What else do we learn about wisdom? Here's the second thing we learn is that wisdom is trustworthy, verses 5 through 9. Oh, simple ones, learn prudence. Oh, fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. And so wisdom invites us to, to learn and grow and change. But in order for us to learn and grow and change, we've got to listen to wis wisdom, right? We've got to listen to wisdom. And, and I want you to notice the way that the words of wisdom are described here in these verses, right? We're told in verse 6 that wisdom speaks noble things. Uh, we're told that wisdom says that which is right. Verse 7 says wisdom will utter truth. Verse 8 says that wisdom will, will speak uh, things that are righteous, right? And, and that there's nothing that's twisted or crooked in the words of wisdom. Um, even going further, verse 9, what wisdom says is straight and right to those who seek knowledge. The point here is that wisdom is trustworthy. We can trust the words of wisdom. What else do we learn about wisdom? Well, the next thing we see is that wisdom is valuable. Verses 10 and 11. Take my instruction instead of silver, 
and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot comprehend with her. When we think of something that is valuable, we tend to think of things like gold, silver, jewelry, treasure, right? We say, oh, treasure is very valuable because if we have treasure, that will give us the kind of life that we want. And what we see God telling us through scripture here is that um, actually wisdom is more valuable than gold or silver or jewels. Because if you have wisdom, not only do you gain treasure, you gain all kinds of other things as well. Right? And so wisdom is extremely, extremely valuable. What else do we learn about wisdom? Well, the next thing we learn is that wisdom is righteous. Verses 12 and 13, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. And so unrighteousness is the way of the fool. Righteousness is the way of uh, the, 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 the wise person. And what we see here is that wisdom hates certain things. Pride, arrogance, the way of evil, uh, perverted speech. Right? We, wisdom hates these things because these things ultimately are not what God wants. But, but what is wisdom about? Well, wisdom, we're told, dwells with prudence, which is, you know, good sense. Or knowledge, you can, you can find knowledge with wisdom. The knowledge here that's being re referred to is specifically like the knowledge of what is moral or ethical, what is, what is good and ethical according to God. Um, and then we also see that wisdom also, uh, it, it leads to discretion, which is uh, speaking or behaving in ways that are not hurtful or offensive to other people. And so what do we see here? We see that, that wisdom is, is righteous, meaning that Wisdom leads to living according to the ways that are right to God. What else do we learn about wisdom? Well, the next thing we see is that wisdom is helpful, right? Wisdom is helpful, verses 14 and 16, through 16. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles and all who govern justly. So we see here that wisdom gives several things, right? We're told wisdom gives counsel, wisdom gives sound wisdom, wisdom gives insight, wisdom gives strength, that, that those who, who listen to wisdom are able to lead in ways that are just. And so wisdom brings sound advice, sound knowledge, and with that advice, that knowledge comes leading in ways that are just and good, in ways that are helpful to others. And so what we see is that wisdom not only helps us, wisdom helps us help others, right? And so wisdom is very, very helpful. What else do we learn about wisdom? Well, the last thing we see here is that wisdom is a blessing, verses 18 through 21. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. So what do we see here? We see wisdom brings many blessings. We're told riches, honor, enduring wealth, uh, righteousness, that, the, that the, the people who live by or according to or follow wisdom ultimately are following the way of righteousness. They're, they're walking in the path of justice. And that we see here is that those who seek and obtain and have wisdom, they receive an inheritance from God, which is an inheritance of many blessings, right? We're, we're not just talking about like, you know, like, like wealth, we're talking about all the various blessings that God gives us, his full inheritance that happen in and through Christ, but along the path of wisdom, right? So when we look at all this, what do we see? Clearly, we see that wisdom 
uh, is something we ought to or should want to pursue, yes? If you have wisdom, it's going to be so much better for you in your life. If you live according to the path of folly, what happens to the fool? The fool destroys him or herself. The wise man or woman is able to live in a way that is according to God's will, God's ways, God's words. And so we want wisdom, right? We want wisdom. So how do we take this idea of, okay, let's, let's pursue wisdom, let's have wisdom, let's grow in wisdom, and how do we apply this? Well, we're doing this series focused on stewardship. In, in, in particular, we're focusing on time, talent, treasure, testimony, although I have to admit that stewardship extends beyond those things. It's bigger than just those things, but we wanted to keep our, our series really kind of uh, very practical, so we're going to be talking a lot about those elements, time, talent, treasure, testimony. For today, we're going to even hone in a little bit, we're going to go a little bit even more in depth and we're going to just focus on one aspect of stewardship, and that is treasure. Or to put it another way, we're going to focus on having or seeking wisdom as it regards to finances. Right? How do you have wisdom when it comes to finances? Okay? How do you do that? What, is it, what does that look like? Uh, what does that mean? Um, you know, I, I uh, was getting my hair cut not, not too long ago, and I was having a conversation with the gal who cuts my hair, and uh, she's, a, she's a believer, and um, I asked her, I said, if you could get training on anything, any topic that would be helpful to you, what would, what would be helpful? And she was like, oh, well, that's, that's easy. Like, the first is finances, and then her second, I think, was like, parenting, and the third was like her like marriage, right? So she was like, the finances by far, number one. And I'm like, really, really? Tell me about that. She's like, well, you know, like we've done like the whole Dave, Dave Ramsey thing and all that, and you know, we've got like the budget and saving and all that. She's like, but now that we've got like some money saved up, like we literally have no idea what we're supposed to do with it. And I'm like, huh. And I was like, you know, it seems to me that probably most people don't, don't really know what to do with finances. And she's like, I know, right? Like, she's like, I never learned anything about finances. She's like, did you learn anything? I'm like, no, I didn't learn anything either. And, and so, I mean, think about this, right? Most people, at least in our American context, don't really have wisdom when it comes to finances. Why? Because they've never been taught. It's really that simple. It's really that simple. This, this is indeed was, was my story, right? So like I grew up in, uh, in poverty, like working class poor. We were poor. Our family was like hard workers and really poor. And that had happened from generation to generation. You know, my grandparents didn't know anything about finances. They didn't teach anything to my parents. My parents didn't know anything about finances. My parents didn't teach me anything about finances. Nobody knew anything about finances. We just worked really hard. I went to public school and learned nothing about finances. I went to college. I have a bachelor's in religion and double master's. I have a master in leadership and then a master in missional leadership. Needless to say, when you do like seminary type school, you learn nothing about finances, right? So like I did all this school Learn nothing about finances. But here's the thing. I have kind of like a, like a, you know, like a, a business mind and a pastor's heart. So I've always just been interested in like business and finances and things like that. And I like to study lots of things, right? So I would just always be like reading books or taking courses or meeting with people who would be mentors or who kind of know about these things and asking lots of questions. And so after years and years and years and years and years of studying, I started to slowly over time learn things about finances. And, uh, you know, I'm not Warren Buffett, but I am a uh, lifelong learner. And I want to share a few things with you that I've learned. Now, before I get into this, though, I'm going to, I got to say a couple things, okay? Usually when I preach the Bible, I just like to stay like right on the text. And we're like, whatever the text is talking about, that's where our application is going to come from. And, uh, and today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the, app, the, the text is wisdom. And we're going we're gonna to basically say, well, how do we have wisdom when it comes to finances regarding our context? Well, 
The Bible is the greatest source of wisdom, but there are lesser sources of wisdom. And when it comes to having particular types of wisdom as it pertains to your context, the time, the place that you live in, sometimes you have to seek out wisdom beyond Scripture, right? I'm not saying it's, that wisdom is more important than Scripture. It's under the authority of Scripture. I'm just simply saying what I'm going to be sharing with you, some of this, some of it will be a little bit Bible. Most of it is just more observational wisdom from living in our context, okay? I, I want to make that distinction really clear because um, I, I don't want you to hear some of what I'm going to share as thus saith the Lord, but rather thus saith Bubba that he learned from someone else, okay? Let's make sure we're, we're putting it in its rightful place. I will say this, if you are like a CPA or you know a lot about finances, then uh, you, this is going to be like a, a refresher for you, and you're going to be like, yeah, whatever, I'm so far advanced beyond that. If you've never learned anything, I hope this will be very, 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 very helpful, and we're going to just kind of lay some basic stuff down. Does that sound good? Okay, so if we're going to have wisdom regarding finances, the first thing we need is we need wisdom regarding money, right? Wisdom regarding money. What is money? Money is a human construct, right? It's a human construct. Basically, um, money is a way to exchange things in uh, our economy. And, and I think this is so fascinating because if you really think about it, like what happens? People, they, they, they give something a value, and what do they do? They put a price to that item, and the price basically represents the value of it. And then they create this stuff, right, called money. That's this currency that we give to pay a price to receive or exchange for the value of the item, which is just interesting if you think about it. Because, you know, when we think of money, some of us think of money as like a piece of paper. Some of us think of money as like, as like ones and zeros or digital. You know, it's all like digital. It's so like you push a button and how much money do I have? And you see a number pop up. And when you really think about it, money is just like a human construct that was invented and doesn't really exist. Isn't that so crazy? And yet at the same time, it does exist because we made it up. And it's very valuable. But at the same time, it's not valuable at all. It's just weird if you think about it. Money is not good or bad. It's morally neutral. Money can be used for good or bad. And so the real true value of money, if you really, tr really think about it, is not in money itself, but is in the way it can be used as a tool. Right, the Bible, when the Bible talks about riches and wealth, the Bible kind of sets out this paradigm where there is the righteous rich and the unrighteous rich. There's the righteous poor and the unrighteous poor. The Bible doesn't say like, well, if you have more money, then you're more righteous, or, well, if you have less money, then you're more righteous. It doesn't do anything like that. It just says, you know what? Whether you're rich or poor, ultimately what matters is are you someone who is righteous or unrighteous, right? Are you righteous? That's what matters. Do you pursue righteousness? That's what matters. And when I say righteousness, I mean, do you live according to that which is right by God, All right? So money is nothing more than a tool that can be used to honor God and bless people. And so having wisdom regarding money and what it is is important so that we can use it in the right ways. But we need other kinds of wisdom as well. What other kind of wisdom do we need? All right, now we need some wisdom regarding like assets and liabilities. So, so, so there is this difference between these two classifications, assets and liabilities. And most people don't understand this. All right now, uh, there's a book called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Any of you, you guys read that? Anyone? So if, if you've never read it, I would recommend reading it. It's a really helpful book. I like the way he talks about assets and liabilities, so I'm going to share with you what he says about it. Robert Kawasaki is the guy who wrote the book. Basically, this is how he, he explains it. Assets bring you money. Liabilities take money away. 
So if you think about it, like an asset is something that puts money in your pocket, and a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. But most people don't understand the differences of these two things. And when you don't understand the differences, it will, it will negatively affect how you spend money or invest money. Instead of investing money, you'll be spending money. Right? A lot of people think that, like, well, their home is an asset, where your home actually, if you think about this, your primary residence is not an asset because it doesn't put money in your pocket. If you were to sell it and make a profit, then it becomes an asset. So you can take a liability and depending on how you use it, turn it into an asset. But an asset is something that brings money into your pocket, right? So if you buy a house and you live in it and you're just putting money towards a mortgage every month, it's a liability. You buy another house and you rent it out to someone else and they're paying you money and it pays the mortgage and all the costs and at the end of it all, you've got a little bit left over, that's an asset, right? You see the difference? Now think about this. How do most people in our context in America, how do most people spend money? They buy all kinds of stuff, right? Like we are, we are consumers. We love to consume, right? We buy all kinds of stuff. Clothes, you gotta have your, oh, I gotta have the right clothes, man. I gotta look good, right? I gotta have an iPhone, uh, and not only do I have to have a computer in my pocket, I've gotta have another computer. I might have two or three computers, right? I gotta have a TV, not just one TV. I need TV for every room. Gotta have a TV for every room. Also, I gotta have a car. You know, we might have to have multiple cars, depending on who, how many people are in our family. Um, oh, well, we gotta buy a house, right? You gotta have a house. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna fill that house up with stuff, right? We're gonna buy so much stuff, we're gonna have to like sometimes, you know, rent a storage place just so we can put our stuff. This is what we do. What is that? It's people spending money on liabilities. That's what it is, right? So what, what, what is the saying? Um, you know, we, we buy things we don't want to impress people we don't like with money we don't have, right? That's what we do. And so if you think about it, most Americans are just dumping money into liabilities. That's what they do. They just put money into a liability. And that does not help, help you grow wealth, right? So you have to understand the difference between these two, and then you've got to change the way you flow money. So, so think of it this way. Um, you know, okay, so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say it this way. Have you ever seen one of those, those guys drive those cars that have like, those cars that have like the loud mufflers on it and the fancy tires and like the spoiler or what, what is it called? Like the, the, like the thing on the back, I don't even know what you call it. Um, and they'll be like driving these like cars and they've got the, like, the little lights, laser light things on the bottom of them. Have you seen these? Whenever you see that guy driving that car, what you say to yourself is, that guy does not understand the difference between assets and liabilities, right? Like, I'll say to my kids, like, when we see that guy show up in that car, I'm like, boys, lesson. You want to know what a fool looks like? There you go. It's like, I got a $60,000, $70,000 car, but no assets. It's like, fool, right, fool. So, okay, I'm sorry, I was on a tangent. Um, <laughs> what would be better? Take that money, go buy a rental house, rent that house out, let the profit of that rental house, now you pay for your liability. You buy a car, you pay for a car off of the profit from the asset. Make sense? You change the flow of where you invest and it changes your future in regards to wealth. That's the way it works, All right? So we need some wisdom regarding these things. And, and, and if you're wondering, like, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because if you are a faithful person and you invest faithfully and you grow the amount of wealth you have to control, that means you will be able to bless more people, right? So ultimately, what is this? It's about honoring God and blessing people. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. So we need some wisdom regarding knowing the difference between assets and liabilities. But we also need other kind of wisdom. We need wisdom as it comes to debt, right, debt. Um, now, this one might be a little controversial, believe it or not, because I've known Christians who are like, 
all debt is bad. It's, it's terrible. And then they like to quote verses, right? I, got, I wrote it down here. Uh, Proverbs 22, 7, that's the one that always gets quoted. The rich rules over the poor and the borrow is a slave of the lender. All debt is terrible. Right? The, the, the most important thing for you to do is be completely debt free. Right? And you were taught that, you were indoctrinated with that ideology because ultimately the banks want to use you to make money. Right? That's why you were taught that. Now, here's what's interesting. If you actually go to Proverbs 22, 7 and you do your study on it, what you will find out is that it's not actually saying that to have debt is a sin. In fact, I haven't been able to find anywhere in the Bible where it says having debt is a sin. Rather, what we're told is that we should never borrow money we don't have the ability to pay back. There's a difference, right? Between just saying like all debt is wrong versus never borrow money you don't have the ability to pay back. And in fact, the Bible tells us repeatedly that if we are to borrow, we need to have, do so in a way to where we are wise and we have the ability to pay it back. And what that verse is actually talking about, Proverbs 22, seven, is um, it's, it's basically saying um, people who don't have the means to pay others back end up getting themselves in a very difficult place. Because in the ancient world, what happened? If you borrowed money and you couldn't pay it back, you literally became a slave to the person you owed money to. You would become their slave until you paid it back. And so the, the, the proverb is saying, don't borrow money that you can't pay back. Now, what does that mean? It means we need to have wisdom when it comes to debt. We need to understand how it works now, so think about our context, because we live in a different context in the ancient world. Debt is different now than it was then, right? There's, there's good debt and bad debt, not in a moral sense, but rather in a practical sense, right? In a practical sense. Good, good debt is when you borrow money to buy assets, and then the asset pays back the debt, and you have something left over when it's all said and done, right? Bad debt is when you borrow money you don't have the ability to repay to buy liabilities. That's bad debt. And with the inv inv uh, invention of the credit card, right, it, it has become easier than ever to accumulate a lot of bad debt. Right? I, I have a friend who growing up, he literally thought credit cards were free money. He was like, they send me these cards and then I can just go out and just swipe it and I buy all this stuff. And he racked up tens of thousands of dollars of debt buying things that he didn't need or want. And then he learned, oh wait, now I have to pay this money back? Like he literally didn't know it as a, like an 18 year old kid, didn't know, didn't know the difference with that. And then what did it happen? It took him years to pay that off, years. Check this out. Because of, because of this, this, just the system we have and the way that credit cards make it so easy to, to, to accumulate debt, the consumer balance in America right now is $4 trillion. $4 trillion. Most of that is student loans and car loans. The average American has $6,500 on a credit card. The average American. And so what do people do? People take a credit card and they buy things that they don't necessarily need with money they don't have. Bad debt, right, bad debt. We don't want bad debt, right? We wanna stay away from bad debt, right? My, here would be my encouragement to you. So like me and Shelly, my wife, we, we, have, uh, we have no bad debt, zero bad debt but we do use credit cards, right? We will take credit cards and we will buy things throughout the month because you can get points, that's helpful. As well, it's easier to return a lot of items if it's on a credit card, because you have like, I think it's like 90 days, I think it is, where you can just return it if something's wrong with that product. And so we'll use credit cards in a way that's very wise, but we never buy more than what we have the ability to pay off. So we'll spend the money on the credit card, and then when the bill comes, we pay it off in full. All right? so you can use a credit card in a way that's wise and not build bad debt. 
But if you understand the way good debt works, you can actually build wealth, right? So, so I'll give you an example. My mom um, bought a house, she paid her house off. She owned her house free and clear, right? That's a, that's a big deal. That's like a, 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 a you know, that was a goal and she accomplished the goal and I commend her for that. And at the, at, there was a point though when I said to her like, why is it so important for you to have your house 100% paid off? And she's like, oh, I don't know. I was, just, I was just told I was supposed to buy a house and pay it off. That's what you do. Oh, okay. I said, well, what, is your, what do you want? Like, what's your goal? And she was like, well, I want to live without any housing costs. That's my goal. Okay, that's a good goal. Do you have housing costs? Yeah, I have housing costs. I have to pay um, taxes and I have to pay insurance. So you still have housing costs, even though your house is paid off free and clear. And so I said to her, look, did you know that there's a way for you to actually just like have some good debt and leverage your house and turn it in, in into an asset? She's like, what do you mean? And so I was like, look, do a cash out refi, pull out 80% of your house, take that money, invest it. And as long as you're making more money off your investment than what it costs you to borrow the money, you're doing well. Right? And so she did that, right? She did that. I have a business that I, I invest the money for her, but so she doesn't have to worry about it. But the point is, she makes, it, it costs her 4% for the loan. Her investment pays that plus taxes and insurance, so no housing costs. And then she makes 10%. She has a 6% spread, so she's making 6% profit. She, she took her house and turned it into an asset and now she lives without any cost, right? That's because she, she, she learned to use good debt in a way that could be helpful, right? So just understanding the difference between how debt works, how it doesn't work, and knowing how to leverage debt when it's the right way for the right reasons can be wise, right? So we need wisdom regarding debt. But we also need other kinds of wisdom. The last kind of wisdom I wanna talk about is wisdom regarding a budget. Right, wisdom regarding a budget. What is a budget? A budget is a spending plan that focuses on uh, income, expenses, goals, and personal convictions. And it may, you may find this to be, to be interesting. I thought it was interesting. Again, like I told you, I like to study things like this because I'm a nerd. Uh, but 80% of Americans say they have a budget, 80%, right? Prior to the pandemic, it was like 50%. And apparently during the pandemic, a bunch of people said, I need a budget. So 80% of Americans have a budget, but here's where it gets really interesting. 65% of Americans have no idea how much money they spent last month. So what does that mean? It means a lot of people have a budget and a lot of people say, I have a budget, and they don't actually use their budget. They don't, they don't pay attention to their budget. But it gets even more interesting because like, it's like six, basically 62% of Americans are living pretty much paycheck to paycheck, right? So 50% of Americans at the end of the month have about $250 left over when it's all said and done. 12% have absolutely nothing left over. So 62% of Americans are living just about paycheck to paycheck. What does that mean? If you don't have a budget, how in the world are you gonna not overspend? Right? You're not gonna be able to, right? So we need a budget. Budgets are important. Now, I am not gonna go into all these details about a budget, right? Because um, we, we just don't have time for that. Plus, there are other people who are much better at that than I am. So what we are doing as a church is we're actually doing um, a, an event we're calling Stewarding Your Finances. It's gonna be on May 21st. and we're gonna have someone who's a member of our church, Doug Collier, he's part of our board of directors, he's a professional CPA. He has literally, over his career, helped thousands and thousands of people do budgets. And so during that, that event, we're gonna have the main session, Doug's gonna teach it, he's gonna help you walk through how to build a budget. If you don't have a budget, he's gonna go through the steps, the process of that, what that looks like. There'll be other sessions that'll happen too. We're gonna have some breakout sessions, there's gonna be a session on like, how to, you know, what you need to know about mortgages, what you need to know about like um, having a, a, an estate plan or a will, insurance, how to buy a house, um, and if you're a small business owner, taxes, 
Uh, and so there's gonna be some different sessions, right? This is all just practical wisdom to equip you, to help you. I would encourage you, if you don't have a budget or you wanna learn more about a budget, go to that event, right? Go to that event. Um, you can find out the details online. What I wanna talk to you about regarding budget, though, is priorities. What, what are your priorities? There, there's a book called uh, Managing Our Finances God's Way, and it was put out by uh, Saddleback Church. And they put out this, this really helpful resource that just helps, talks a lot about you know, finances and money and things like that. And one of the things that they talk about in there is understanding the priorities uh, of budgeting. And I wanted to share something with you that came from that book that I hope you will find helpful. I thought it was really helpful. Um, basically, it talks about the different, the different priorities, right? If you look at this chart, what you see is that when it comes to budgeting, the world's priorities uh, are, are, are one way and God's priorities are another way. And so the way that the world does it is the world says, look, we're going to like spend our money on lifestyle. So what is lifestyle? Lifestyle is like, you know, buying all the stuff you want, right? Going out and having fun. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's vacations. It's, you know, it's eating out at restaurants. It's, you know, clothing. It's movies. It's all the fun stuff, right? All the fun stuff. So the world says, look, let's spend our money on lifestyle. And then after we do that, well, we got to pay taxes because if we don't, we'll get arrested, right? And we don't want to get arrested. So we'll have to pay the taxes. And then after we do that, well, then, you know, we'll pay back our debts if we have something left over. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to file bankruptcy. We'll pay our debts back. And then if there's anything left, we'll, we'll save some money. We might invest some money. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And then after all that's said and done, then we'll give, which most don't because there isn't anything left over. Because what's the end result of the way that the world does budgeting? The end result is overspending, right? That's what happens. Yeah, you just end up overspending. God's priorities are very different than the way that the world does priorities, which means if we want to be faithful stewards, we need to have our priorities be aligned with God's priorities. And so the way that we prioritize our finances looks different, right? It looks different. And if, if you were to kind of follow the guidelines of Scripture, it would follow this order of priorities. So the first priority for a person of faith is giving, Believe it or not, that's actually what Scripture says, that God gives us everything we have, and we are to give back to God and His mission, our first fruits. So the very first thing when we budget, the first thing we need to think about is, how much can I give? Not how much do I have to give, how much do I get to give, right? How much do I get to give? And we want to budget our giving because God commands us to do that. The second thing it, it, we want to do is we want to budget our savings and our investing. God commands us to take care of our family and our relatives, which means making sure that you've got money set aside for an emergency, if an emergency should happen, and you've got money set aside to invest for the future so that your family can be taken care of. So you want to budget savings and investing. Third is debt repayment. Right? The Bible says pay everyone what is owed them, and so, of course, we want to have good debt and we want to make sure that we have a plan and a budget so that we can pay that good debt back on time. Then the fourth would be taxes because the scriptures say, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So we got to pay our taxes even though we don't want to, still have to. Um, and then after all that stuff comes lifestyle. Right? Then comes the fun stuff, right? The, the clothes and the events and, you know, the vacations and all that stuff, right? So, so, so if you have your priorities aligned with God's priorities, the way you spend money is going to look different than the way that the world spends money. What is the end result? The end result is contentment. Believe it or not, that's actually the end result. Because when your priorities are aligned with God's priorities, it leads to peace. It leads to security. It leads to joy. It leads to contentment, right? Contentment. And so, I want you to think for a moment, if you will, about stewardship in general, but how you steward your finances in particular, okay? Now, 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 you may not realize this, but 
The topic Jesus spoke of most was actually money. He spoke about finances more than anything else. And, and I'll admit, rarely do we actually talk about finances as the Big C Church and even as Resurrection Church. We just don't talk about this very often because people get all bent out of shape when we talk about money. Right? They, they, may, they have all kinds of assumptions. Well, if the pastor talks about money, the pastor just wants my money. No. How about we talk about money because money is a major item of stress in most people's lives, and it is a very important topic, especially when it comes to our stewardship, which is a big part of being faithful. So here's my question. How is your stewardship of your finances, or the, I should say it this way, how is the stewardship of the finances God has entrusted you, how's it going? How's it going? Are you being a faithful steward of that which God has entrusted you? Do you, do you need wisdom, right? Do you lack wisdom? And you're like, oh, I don't know, I lack wisdom, I need wisdom. Or would you, do you say, like, no, I'm, I'm being faithful. You know, I, know, I know some of you, you've spent the time and the energy and you've learned how to have wisdom when it comes to your finances, and some of you are very, very, very faithful, and I want you to hear this as a reminder of the importance of your faithfulness and hear it as an encouragement to you, right? Like, this should be an encouragement. You'd be like, yeah, we, we have been faithful. We are being faithful. Praise God. Some of you, though, I, I know some of you, you're at the beginning of this journey. You're, you're like, I, I, I don't have very much wisdom, if any, when it comes to finances. Like, I just don't know about this stuff. I need to learn about this stuff. I, I was never taught anything, and so I've got to figure this stuff out. And that's totally okay. That's totally okay. That's part of why we're talking about it, is to help you figure it out, to help you figure it out. There are very wise people who are part of our church who can help you, who can walk with you, disciple you, give you wisdom when it comes to this kind of stuff. And there are also probably some among us who would say, you know what, I just haven't been faithful and I know it's wrong and I need to change. And if so, if God is putting that on your heart, that's God saying, look, it's time to change this area of your life. And you should receive that as God's loving prompt to see you grow and mature and change. Right? That's, that's God inviting you to become more faithful. Right, we're going to be tempted with our finances to be fools. And, and the reason for this is, is so simple. Because if you are a fool, you will just give your money away to other people who want your money because they're greedy. Right? I mean, there's all kinds of, like, how many, like, have you ever had this happen where you're like, you're having a conversation with something about some item, you know, like, I don't know, it could be anything. You'd be like, oh, you know, I was thinking about, like, getting a new pair of boots. And then you pull open your phone, and then what do you see? Ads for boots. You're like, how did they do that? How did that happen? They're reading my mind. Right? Have you ever experienced that? I've experienced that. That's weird. It's creepy. It's temptation, right? Oh, you like all this temptation. It's coming to you from your phone. It's right there. You're looking out in the world. There's advertisements everywhere. We absorb thousands and thousands of advertisements every single day. I mean, if you think about like the course of civilization and humanity, I don't know if there's ever been a time when people were in an inundated with as much advertisement as now which means there's more temptation now than ever before to be a fool when it comes to your finances. And yet we're called to live counterculturally. We're called to have wisdom. We're, we're called to, 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 to be able to cut through all of that and say, nope, nope, nope. I, my priorities are aligned with God's priorities. I want what God wants. Which means we have to constantly be mindful of these things. If you want something, to, if you want it to be easy, if you want instant gratification, if you want to do what you want to do when you want to do it, you will be tempted. And if you get into those desires, you will give in to the temptation. Right? Faithful stewardship requires intentionality, self-control, 
Discipline, wisdom. It requires these things. And yet, there is such a great reward in faithfulness because you're able to honor God and bless a lot of people. And so, here, here's the heart of the matter, friends, right? To grow in stewardship, grow in wisdom. It's really that simple. To grow in stewardship, grow in wisdom. God wants you to have wisdom. God gives wisdom. If you think about even the gospel, the gospel is a gospel of wisdom. Our God is infinitely wise. Our God has an infinitely wise plan. God in his wisdom did what a lot of people thought was folly and foolishness. Foolishness. Right? God went to the cross to suffer and die for our sins, to pay the debt we owe. And people would look at the cross and say, foolishness, that's folly. And yet God took that which appeared to be folly to those who were perishing and revealed what is actually his power, and that is he conquered sin and death through the cross of Christ. Jesus lived without sin, died for our sin, rose from the grave conquering sin and death so that we could be, receive not only salvation and eternal life, we could receive fellowship with God himself. And God has done all of that for us, for you, being able to see the plan of God, the ways of God, requires wisdom. God gives wisdom. You are called to be a steward of God who lives according to wisdom. And I hope, I hope, I hope you hear this message and it inspires you to say, I want to grow in wisdom so I can grow in stewardship. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you give us practical instructions. We also thank you that we see clearly in your word the kind of the value, um, the importance of, of, of wisdom. You know, we see all these things about wisdom showing us just how incredibly uh, important it is in our lives. And I do pray and I ask God, help us to be a people who seek you out. First, that we would have relationship with you. Also help us to be a people, God, who seek you out so that we could grow in wisdom. We could grow in wisdom through your word. We could grow in wisdom in practical ways that we could live our lives, God, as you want us to. And Lord, um, I pray, give us, give us eyes to see all the various means of temptation that exist. God, as, even as we navigate our, our week this week, as we go throughout our lives, as we, see, as we see certain things, would you just help us see like, oh, that's foolishness. Oh, that's wisdom. Uh, would you help us to see, oh, that, that's a temptation towards foolishness. I don't want that. God, give us, give us those warning signs. Give us the, those convictions. Help us to, to understand the difference between wisdom and folly. And ultimately, God, I'm praying and asking, help us to be a wise people who live according to your wisdom, your ways. Lord, I do pray, may we be a generous people with our time, talent, treasure, and testimony. May we be a generous people in the way we steward our lives uh, and the finances that you've entrusted to us. God, help us to honor you and help us to bless others. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen.